So welcome back. Um, we're really glad to have you here at Stanford. Um, and it, it's a pleasure to see so many old friends. Um, I'm Pam Carlin. I'm the Kenneth and Harl Montgomery Professor of Public Interest Law here at the law school. And um, I just returned from 20 months on leave working at the United States Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division, uh, overseeing the Justice Department's voting rights litigation, among other things. And if you look at that picture in the upper right-hand corner, you look really, really carefully. Do we have the laser pointer to you? Yeah. If you look <laughs> really, 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 really carefully. <laughs> this is the 50th anniversary of the march over the Selma uh, the Edmund Pesbridge in Selma, that's the president, and that's me. <laughs> um, but you got to look really carefully. I spent a lot of time looking for a picture where you could actually, you could actually see me. I've now learned, I, I wondered, some of my friends were really aggressively moving to the front, and I couldn't figure out why. Now I know. Um, but it is a pleasure to be back here at Stanford uh, and to be teaching. I teach, uh, many years I teach a course called The Law of Democracy. Um, and I teach various constitutional law related courses. And I help to run the Supreme Court litigation clinic here. And I will now let Nate introduce himself. And then we'll jump right into the uh, stuff that we thought would be interesting to talk about with you. So my claim to fame is I'm Pam's former student. Uh, uh, I was actually here when she visited from UVA 20 years ago, um, and, uh, but I'm a 98 grad of the law school and have uh, bounced around since then. I started my career at Penn, went to Columbia, and then two years uh, came back home uh, to Stanford. And so I do, I'm a law professor and a political scientist. I teach also in the, in the college here in communication and political science. Uh, but but uh, I work in this area as well. I've tried to sort of following Pam's lead, uh, have been appointed by courts on many occasions to draw districts for Cong Congress and state legislatures, and do a lot of work in campaign finance. And then uh, most recently was the uh, research director of the President's Commission on Election Administration. This was the commission that President Obama put together to deal with long lines on Election Day. Uh, and we dealt with all kinds of issues from voting accessibility to voter registration to uh, the, dealing with natural disasters in voting, voting technology, and the like. So uh, we've dealt with a lot of the different uh, uh, areas of law of democracy. And today we're going we're gonna to sort of focus on three big topics. We're going to look, I mean, the, the law of democracy is, has been expanding ever since uh, Bush versus Gore sort of shined a light on it, or a magnifying glass, if you will. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about the sort of new voting restrictions that have been of flourishing in the last few years, last five to seven years. We'll talk about redistricting and the Supreme Court cases that are coming up, and then we'll talk about campaign finance. Uh, but we hope that we'll get you know a lot of questions from you. We'll try to we'll try to do this. I don't know. I was going to say Charlie Rose style, but that's not quite true. We're going to sort of no, because you're not going to fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> no, and we need, and we would need a you're not lying in bed falling and, asleep. Um, yeah. Uh, well, all right. So why don't we start by talking a little bit about, uh, in each of these, sort of where we were and where we are now. So on the big topics of voting rights, right, if you, if you take one of our classes, um, you know, you learn the case law on poll taxes, literacy tests, and the like. And then now, fast forward, it's paired with cases dealing with things like voter identification laws, shortening voting periods, uh, restrictions on registration, and the like. On redistricting, um, to some extent, it's back to the future uh, because the Supreme Court has a one-person, one-vote case that is going to be argued next month. And the question in that case is whether you should draw districts around people or around citizens. Um, and then also issues of racial vote dilution and minority uh, racial gerrymandering. And then finally, campaign finance is, is one that uh, now has become salient uh, to most observers of American politics. So uh, people are familiar with the Citizens United decision, even if they don't know what it means. But it's become a kind of metaphor for everything that's wrong in uh, the campaign finance system. I mean, and one thing just to, I, I always like to quote a line of um, President Bush's in thinking about these issues, which is he said, I, I believe we're on an irreversible course towards more freedom and democracy, but that could change. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, the, the commonplace story of democracy in America is we have become an ever more democratic and participatory country. It's a kind of triumphal story 
in which we go from a time in which the franchise was limited to only white male property owning citizens to a much more expansive uh, notion of who could vote. But in fact, over the course of American history, uh, enfranchisement has gone up and down and up and down. It is a series of cycles within which uh, there's been a lot of development. So we're going to talk about where we are in the current cycle. One thing that I think makes this this cycle unique, though, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, so, so much of the, like when I was taking Pam's course, the foundational cases were about African-American enfranchisement, right? So the literacy test cases, the poll tax cases, and the like. Um, I think it's unique, but partly because of, of political change in the South and the polarization in, in the country, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I don't think you see in American history the systematic patterns of uh, legislation that you see based on partisanship. Um, what we're seeing now, um, particularly in the voter ID fight, is, is characteristic of that, that um, some states have voter ID laws and have enacted them in the last seven years, and some don't. And it really does depend on which party is controlling uh, the state government. That's not as true with early voting. Early voting is a kind of interesting phenomenon where um, actually sometimes the Republican-controlled states actually are more generous on early voting than the Democratic states. But when it, voter, the new restrictions on, on voter ID and the new restrictions on uh, registration, I think, have a particular and unique partisan valence to them. Yeah, I, th I think that's true in part because more parts of the country today have actual two-party competition than was true in the last round of restrictions on the franchise where you had really the one-party South and one-party Democratic control in a lot of uh, large urban areas where it was a, really a contest between uh, native-born citizens and immigrants, and that uh, explained a lot of the restrictions at the kind of turn of the 20th century. So here, here's where we are in the sort of legal debate over voter ID. So the Supreme Court upheld the Indiana voter ID law, uh, what is it now, seven years ago, in this case, Crawford versus Marion County. Um, and with an opinion actually written by Justice Stevens. So it's not as if it was um, a, you know, a familiar breakdown. Um, and that was a six uh, to three decision, although it was kind of fractured, it was sort of. I think it's it actually four. three, three, I was three, say three, 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 three. Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is like what, the old joke, right? You know, <laughs> nine justices, ten opinions, right? Um, uh, but so, but Justice Stevens, part of it. So, I don't know if you, if you came up with this or 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 where I heard this, but it's like, so Justice Stevens writes an opinion upholding voter ID, and raising a, a concern about the possibility of fraud. In elections, right, um, and that has become, you know, uh, part of the the debate and the trope of, regarding uh, voter ID. And you wonder, well, what, did, you know, Justice Stevens, who's often seen as one of the more liberal justices on law democracy issues, why is what's he worried about? I mean, why is he so focused on the fraud issue, which was which he even admits in the case in Indiana had not been proven. Uh, but you know, he was a Republican who grew up in Chicago. You know, <laughs> fraud was not, you know, was not like a Incident. It was sort of a way of life, right? You know, and and so uh, this is sort of the Justice Stevens on the couch approach to uh, uh, voter ID laws. Um, but that that case uh, has made a big difference because now, at least on their face, uh, many voter ID laws are constitutional, and the Supreme Court said that they are justified to combat fraud or the appearance of fraud. Okay, uh, sort of a remarkable aspect of of, of those cases. Um, as, let me put on my political scientist hat for a second. I should say, you can tell when I'm a political scientist because I have data without opinions. And when I'm a law professor, I have opinions without data. Uh, and then if I, uh, I'm a lawyer, it sort of depends on who my client is. Uh, but but the, the, uh, here's, so, so you might wonder, why, where, does this, where is the voter ID controversy coming from? On the one hand, you, you could have a kind of nefarious um, explanation um, based on, on polarization, but why now as opposed to 20 years ago? And the roots of the voter ID controversy actually come out of Bush versus Gore, and it comes out of the 2000 uh, election controversy, where in response to what happened in Florida, we had um, a debate over the Help America Vote Act. And for the first time, uh, there was a, it was bipartisan legislation that uh, put together 
we gave money to states in order to deal with tech, voting technology so that we didn't have punch card ballots. Um, it also provided for something called provisional ballots, which would you know, make sure that no one was turned away from the polling place. And as part of the deal, there was also for the first time in federal law some kind of voter ID requirement for people who had, were first time voters who registered by mail. It was not a photo ID requirement. It was actually something you could do pretty easily, uh, you could, a utility bill, all kinds of things. But if you're a first time voter who registered by mail, that was um, what you would, uh, you had some ID requirement. And uh, then, so that was, that was the beginning of this debate, which then accelerated with the so-called ACORN controversies in the, in the 2004 and later uh, elections um, dealing with voter registration fraud. Not that, you know, when they said like all the Dallas Cowboys registered uh, or Mickey Mouse registered to vote in, the, in certain places. It's not that they voted, right? Um, that would have been interesting. Uh, but but that, that there, was, there were errors in the voter registration rolls, and so that sort of accelerated. It then, because the Supreme Court intervened or, or conditionally blessed voter ID in Indiana, uh, it really accelerated after that so that now you have, you know, um, st the, all of the red states here on the right have, uh, since the, even the 2010 election, have uh, enacted new voting restrictions. Um, some of them, uh, many of them are voter ID, and a lot of it, of course, depends on the partisan control of, of those states. I mean, one of the things that it's hard when you talk to an audience like this to get across is just how many people in America lack currently valid, government-issued photo IDs from the state they live in and intend to vote in. Um, because I, I wager everybody in this room has a picture ID issued by the government that you could use to vote. You have passports, you have driver's licenses, you have military veterans cards and the like. But in Texas, for example, which is where I uh, worked on litigation this past summer challenging Texas's voter ID law, there are, uh, depending on how you estimate it, somewhere between 600 and 800,000 people who are registered to vote, that is, Texas doesn't contest that these people are eligible citizens registered to vote, who lack currently, currently valid government-issued ID. Uh, sometimes they lack it because they are too poor to have a car, and so they don't bother to have a driver's license. Or they're old and their driver's licenses have expired, and Texas won't let you use an expired license. Or they moved to Texas after they retired to live with their kids, and they don't need a driver's license. Or they lost their driver's license. Or their driver's license was suspended, and they had to surrender it to the state or the like. Um, and so it is amazing how many people don't have government-issued ID. At the time that Georgia adopted its law, there was an estimate that a third of African-American men in Georgia between the ages of 18 and 35 who were registered to vote did not have driver's licenses. Um, and so one of the things that's hard to get across in the debate is that there are a lot of people who don't have something that pretty much every upper middle class American citizen has. Um, and that's why this argument about fraud has such traction is people all say, well, you need a driver's license to uh, get into the, you need photo ID to get into the federal courthouse. You need federal, you need photo ID to get on an airplane. Why shouldn't you need it for uh, going to, uh, going to vote? Yes, sir. Right, but in order to get one of those cards, Texas has those as well, you need a certified copy of your birth certificate if you don't already have valid, other valid government-issued ID. And one of the things, the testimony and, and witnesses that we looked at in uh, Georgia, uh, in Texas, uh, in South Carolina, in, um, in North Carolina, where these laws were challenged, is if you were born at home in the rural South, you never got a birth certificate. If you, don't, if you can't remember which county you were born in, you, don't, you can't find a birth certificate. And there are a lot of old people that can't remember that. If there is an error on your birth certificate in how your name is spelled, then you have to go and get the birth certificate corrected. In order to get a certified copy of your birth certificate, you have to pay $45. Um, so there are a lot of hurdles here. My favorite example, which actually came from Indiana, was there was a woman who moved to Indiana from, I think it was Massachusetts, and went to get the ostensibly free uh, 
card. They said, we need a certified copy of your birth certificate. So she wrote to Massachusetts, got a certified copy of her birth certificate, and went back. And then they said, this isn't going to be good enough. Why? Take a guess as to what the name was on the birth certificate. Exactly. So now they wanted a certified copy of her marriage license to show that the name under which she was seeking to register was the name of the person who was born low these many years ago in, Mass in Massachusetts. Now, this is expensive, it's time consuming, and for people who are not used to dealing with government bureaucracy, it's intimidating and it's hard to do. So it's even states that allow for free ID often require you to pay for the underlying documents you need in order to get the free ID. And that's why, that's why it's actually kind of a problem. Let me uh, throw out one, one kernel of hope in this debate, which is that, um, and this comes out of the work we did at the Presidential Commission, which is that this is one of those areas where technology could actually have an effect. Uh, so as states move toward uh, electronic poll books and they merge their voter registration databases with their DMV databases, it will be, the, is feasible now, as, as we used to say at the Presidential Commission, it's not rocket surgery, uh, where, where, where you could, you actually put... Not to mention we've recently learned that even brain surgery isn't brain surgery. <laughs> um, that you can, that the government, that the state government and the, and the people in the polling place will actually have the pictures of people who have, have driver's license and the like. And for those who don't, right, the, who fall into the categories that Pam was talking about, um, these electronic poll books are basically iPads, and so at least for the first time that they come, you can actually take their picture, and then they, there'll be a, a photo on file. And so this is one of those areas where maybe we'll see, even in those areas with um, uh, voter ID laws, some amelioration of it. Yeah. Generally, you just ask people to sign under penalty of perjury that they're a citizen, they're over the age of 18, they live where they say they live, and they are not disqualified on the basis of having been convicted in some states of a felony or like. I voted not simultaneously, I just want to make this clear. I voted in my life in Connecticut, in New York, in Virginia, and in California. I have never been required at the polling place in any of those states to show any form of identification. I've been required to sign the poll book in those places, but never been required to show any identification. And when I registered to vote in all of those cases, but California, where I used motor voter when I moved to the state and I, and I changed my driver's license, I just checked the box there. But in none of the other states was I required to show anything at the time I registered other than to say under penalty of perjury that I was, in fact, a citizen of the United States eligible vote. And there's very little showing. I mean, there, there is vote fraud in the United States. I don't want to deny that there's vote fraud. Almost all of the vote fraud in the United States that has occurred in the 20th or the 21st century involves inflated roles and what I call wholesale vote fraud. That is, either candidates or uh, members of the political parties who are running the elections engage in the fraud. It makes no sense to think that if you were in the country illegally or you were not eligible to vote, that you would run the risk of getting caught voting under somebody else's name because the benefit to you of doing that is very small and the potential risk to you of doing that is very large. And that's why the couple of cases that, that have come up recently where non-citizens were found to have voted, they almost all involved people who made completely honest mistakes. That is, they received... Um, something that said from the government that said, "Do you want to register to vote?" And they said yes without reading it. So, Well, there will be government, in, uh, there is government IDs for non-citizens uh, here and in other places as well. And then the question is, how big a problem is that? I mean, you have to weigh the 
costs and benefits here as to whether, you know, how big a problem is, is the risk of fraud and how big a problem do we think the number of people will be who, who don't have uh, IDs. Um, so the area where you see the fraud, and then this builds on what Pam was saying, is in absentee ballots. All right? and, and there's no, and the thing, here's the big irony about the voter ID debate, right, is that you have fraud over here, which is in the absentee ballot, particularly in group home quarters where people, candidates will go into nursing homes and, and, and get, um, uh, do shenanigans with absentee ballots and vote by mail. And yet voter ID is over here in the polling place where you actually have the state essentially watching you as you come in, right? And so we have this, this bizarre situation where we have a remedy that is uh, going after a situation where the problem doesn't actually uh, exist. And, so, and, and, and that aspect is going to get worse. And it's, I, I mean, again, I don't want to overstate the amount of absentee voter fraud also. But as you know, so now Oregon, Washington, for the most part, Cal Colorado, all do vote by mail. We here in California, about two thirds of our votes are, this time are going to be done by mail. Arizona, it's the same thing. It's a, Was it's a Western phenomenon. Uh, and that's going to be the area, you know, where it's outside the view of the, of the any polling official. And it's not really the area where voter ID is going to make a difference. No, no, no. No, there are plenty of, I mean, voter registration. Voter registration is, a, you know, that's an impediment. Right. Talk about your study. Yeah. <laughs> there is a bar, by the way, with so with competency. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and then you'd break the law, you know, and so, the, yeah. Do you want to take it anyway? Well, I, I mean, I can tell you what the current standard is and then what I think of the current standard. The current standard is that the right of citizens to vote is a fundamental constitutional right, and the state cannot impose undue burdens on that right. And the question of what counts as an undue burden is very much contested right now. That is, there's a lot of disagreement about what constitutes an undue burden. My own view is that every eligible citizen ought to be able to vote as long as they are registered to vote. And I understand, as Nate says, registration imposes some burden on people because it means that you have to affirmatively take the responsibility of registering. And I will just point out that in a lot of countries, including Canada, the government automatically registers everybody. Um, and in countries, for example, where there are national ID cards, yeah. The registration function is, list, is, is, is linked to those national ID cards so that people never have the burdens that you know, people in the United States have of registering to vote. Over, you know, the arguments have been made that you know, it, in so, to some degree that are based, I think, on the implicit idea that people should be well informed to have to vote. And if you just allow everybody to vote, a whole bunch of people who are not well informed will vote. And the answer to that is, it may well be true that lots of people are not particularly well informed who vote, but it is a fundamental civic right, and I think there shouldn't be burdens put on it like you have to go and get your birth certificate in order to vote, unless we have some really good reason to think that that will increase the integrity of elections. And I've yet to see any evidence that suggests that the states with uh, di that make it difficult to vote either have a greater fraud problem or have more integrity in their elections.
Absolutely, you have to pass a written test to get a driver's license. Yes. But again, part of the question is, that suppose if we had a national ID card, this melts away, right? The whole issue here is that there, there, there is a bias in who has ID and who doesn't, right? And then there, there's an impediment. If we were like, every, it's funny, when I give like international talks on this, uh, it's actually the left. When I say in New York, all you had to do was sign the polling booth, they're like, are you crazy, right? Because they're, they're worried in Mexico, for instance, they're worried about, well, that's that right for fraud, right? And I say, well, uh, and it's the left worried about fraud on the right. And, uh, but every, virtually every other country in the world has a national ID card. And so instead, we, we're reliant on the, the passports and, the, and driver's licenses as the main source of ID. But if you have, you know, if you have national ID or state ID that, that, that's given freely to everyone, then, then this melts away because then there's no discrimination. Um, I think we should probably move to the second next topic, but, yeah. but I know everyone's energized, but you've been, you've been uh, raising your hand several times. So. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. Um, but the question well, and also you can't get government benefits in Brazil without showing up with the receipt from the last time you voted as part of, yeah. I mean, which actually is more than the fine, why people, why people vote. So what's going on with Alabama? Is it not Is that like the what's the matter with it's Kansas? It's the gift <laughs> that keeps on giving. <laughs> with, the, with the driver's licenses? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, you can talk. Well, I mean, they, this is this is very new. I so. mean, there's been a little bit of backing down on the state. They're oh, they're going to reopen some of those drivers' licenses, and somebody's about to file a lawsuit about it. Um, because, and of course, the irony of telling people who don't have drivers' licenses they should go to DMVs to get driver's licenses. DMVs are generally set up in places where it's easy to drive to them. They're not set up in places where very few people uh, drive because then they're not really providing a service to drivers. But yeah, the, the Alabama problem is Alabama is requiring you to get the IDs from DMVs, whether they are driver's licenses or state IDs. And then they've closed the, uh, the driver's license offices in, I think it's like 30 counties. Yeah, yeah. Why don't we move to uh, the redistricting yeah. cases, if that's OK? And, and because there's been a lot of uh, th this. You're going to hear about this in the next month quite a bit. So this is also the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and so here's where we are, which is that, strangely enough, the one person, one vote cases, which you know, Earl Warren said were the most important of his tenure on the court, even more than Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, did not resolve a particular question which is coming up to the court next month. And that is, uh, yeah, one person, one vote, but what's the denominator? Uh, equal you know, uh, numbers of what? Persons, citizens, and the like. There's a case called Burns versus Richardson where the court said, well, you can draw it on the basis of equal numbers of registered voters. You can draw it on the basis of equal numbers of people. We'll leave it up to the state. Uh, in Texas, we, there are a group of plaintiffs who are coming in and saying, well, no, if you believe in the equal weight of everyone's vote, which is what the one person, one vote cases they say was about, well, then it has to be equal numbers of eligible voters. And what happens in Texas, because of a large non-citizen community, some of these districts have twice the number of eligible voters as other. Yeah, we have, a, we have a graphic. Oh, it. yeah. Let's uh, put the, oh, wait. It's, it's, wait, I got to show this, though, just yeah. the, you know, in my yeah. sort of uh, my, my. Your historian's mode. Right. Yeah. The, the, to, to, you know, if you learn one thing, this was the original gerrymander. Where does the name gerrymander come from, right? It's Eldridge Jerry, a governor of Massachusetts who drew a district that packed his political opponents into this district. Um, and the journalist who was uh, looking at this said, wait a second, that's not a salamander, that's a gerrymander. And then this is the first um, cartoon. This was, this was the, the gerrymander uh, that, that was basically overlaid on the map, you could see, of the counties in, or the towns in Massachusetts. So, you know, now you can whip that in a cocktail conversation. Um, and then we have you know, the classic racial gerrymanders dealing with, uh, this is the famous Tuskegee gerrymander, which excised African Americans from the city of Tuskegee. Um, but what we have now, and um, let's see, 
yeah. is in this new one person, well, you want to, these are your maps. Why don't you uh, talk yeah. about it? Yeah, so um, depending on where you live in the country, the number of people who are citizens of voting age as a proportion of the total population differs dramatically. And this gives you a sense in different congressional districts around the country, how many of the people who live in that district are citizens of voting age and how many of them aren't. So there are obviously are some parts of the country where virtually everybody is a citizen and a large proportion of the citizens are over the age of 18. As you move into parts of the country that are more heavily Latino, two things happen. One is a lower percentage of the people who live in those areas are citizens. And the second is because the age um, uh, kind of demographic profile in the Latino community is disproportionately young, a much higher percentage are under the age of 18. So when you get down to, for example, the congressional districts that are on the, on the Texas-Mexico border in particular, and you get into some of the districts that are in the internal part of California, a much lower percentage of the people who live in those districts are 18 years old or above and are citizen, US citizens. Um, the census has always counted everybody. It's just a count of everybody who lives there. So the one thing in Burns Against Richardson that was weird, and I've never really been able to figure out why this was so, is in the, it, and it's a count on April 1st of the year ending in zero, is that for some reason, Hawaii in 1960 counted the people who were living in hotel rooms in Waikiki as residents of Hawaii. And they also counted all of the naval personnel whose ships were based in Pearl Harbor as living in uh, on Oahu. Now, obviously, those two groups of people are not bona fide residents of Hawaii in the way that lots of legal permanent residents of the United States and undocumented people actually live in particular jurisdictions. Those two groups of people, tourists and naval personnel, the tourists and the naval personnel live someplace else, but they got counted uh, in Hawaii. And that's what the problem was in Hawaii. But the problem now is, if you look at different congressional districts in the United States, the congressional district that's the most heavily citizens of a, uh, adult citizens in the United States has twice as many adult citizens in it as the districts that have the lowest number of US citizens in them. And for example, just to take Los Angeles, because it may be a particularly powerful example for those of you who are familiar with Los Angeles politics. Los Angeles County Commission has the largest uh, districts in the country. The most heavily Latino district for the Los Angeles County Commission has uh, half the number of citizens of voting age in it as the most heavily Anglo district. So if you're trying to equalize the weight of each person's vote, you have a very different, you would draw those districts in a very different way than if you're trying to equalize the number of people in each district. And the issue in front of the Supreme Court in the Evanwell against Abbott case is, does the Constitution require you to use one number or the other, or does the Constitution give the state the choice as to which of these numbers it wants to use? Uh, I filed a brief in the case on behalf of myself and, and other redistricting experts on the very nerdy point that we don't actually have a list of citizens in the United States. I mean, you all think that we know where citizens live. and All of the data here about citizenship is actually based on surveys. Um, the American Community Survey. And so uh, even if you, want, if you wanted to redistrict on the basis of equal numbers of citizens, and they, we, do, we certainly don't have a database that talks about eligible voters. That we don't have. Uh, so you can't actually redistrict on the basis of equal numbers of citizens, even if you wanted to, unless you're willing to use survey data, which are averages over the previous five years. Uh, and so I'm hoping that the court just you know, says we can't even deal with this issue because there's no real remedy uh, for the plaintiffs that they're trying to bring it. Um, it is a, it's a remarkable case on, on many levels. It would have huge effects, huge effects in representation if the court then says, as a rule, that it's constitutionally required to draw equal numbers of districts around eligible voters. Yeah? No, but we have a census which will have, I mean, you're right. You know, but look, and at any given time, right, the day after the census, everything's changing anyway. It's like I used to say, you know, the, the one person, one vote case is dealing with Congress. 
really do require equal numbers of people per district for the most part. Um, and I used to say, you know, to my class that, you know, look, when there's a sale at Macy's, right, there's different numbers of people in each district. It's not as if on census day, the people stay frozen for the redistricting cycle for the next 10 years, right? But, but and so, well, it's not as imprecise as a survey. Yeah. Well, it's a census. Uh, I mean, it, and the difference between a census and a survey, so with respect to, say, citizenship, the American Community Survey is produced by a, a survey of 2.5% of American households each year, and then you'll get averages over the previous five-year period, and that's what we would use for whenever you see stuff about citizenship, that's what it's based on. The census probably has about 97% coverage. Um, and obviously, there's going to be some places that are, you know, Native American reservations, it's very difficult to count people. Um, and, you know, different populations are going to have uh, greater difficulty. But it is at least, and the census is prescribed in the Constitution, right? That it is in Article One. It is the way that we uh, estimate the number of, or can, that, that, that we come to the number of congressmen that each state gets. And so uh, there really is no requirement in the Constitution that you count citizens, right? Um, the requirement is an actual enumeration of persons. And so we'll see how the, the court uh, deals with this uh, next month. And the, the, the same day that they're going to hear this case, they're going to hear another case about redistricting that's gotten less attention, but also raises a really interesting issue, which is the Supreme Court, you know, one of the reasons that Chief Justice Warren thought that uh, Reynolds against Sims, which was the case that announced that you had to have equal numbers of people in, in state legislative districts, was his most important opinion, is he said this would get rid of the idea that special interests control the government and henceforth the public interest rather than special interests would control the government. So he turns out to have been a little optimistic there. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things that uh, the court has had trouble doing since then is they got rid of one kind of gerrymandering with one person, one vote, which is you can no longer draw districts and just stick with them for the next 50 or 60 years the way that states did between 1900 and 1962 when Alabama did not redistrict once between 1900 and 1962. Illinois did not redistrict between 1900 and 1950-something. And so people really had moved around a lot. The suburbs had grown up and just weren't represented at all. Rural areas had lost huge population, but they held a majority of the state legislature still. And they got rid of that. Um, but almost immediately, you started having what were referred to as equipopulist gerrymanders, which is Nate and I have both worked on these. And the sophistication of the models that People can run through the computers. Make it true now to say uh, in a lot of states that rather than you going into the voting booth every two years and selecting your representatives, every 10 years, the representatives go into a closed room and select you. So that we know and we can predict what's going to happen in the next congressional district and probably, what would you say, in 400 of the 435 districts, Nate and I can tell you today who's going to win those districts without knowing who the candidates are, without knowing what the economy looks like, without knowing anything else, because the districts were drawn by politicians to protect one, per, one party or the other in the districts. And sometimes it's uh, one party seizing as many seats in a state as they can. And sometimes, as in California before the uh, Independent Redistricting Commission, it was the two parties getting together and essentially protecting all the incumbents in, in, in Congress. Let me offer one friendly yeah. amendment on that, which is that it's not just uh, the people behind the curtain, but because we have become so polarized uh, and predictable in our partisan preferences, um, geographic political segregation, even apart from nefarious gerrymandering, is going to predetermine so many of these uh, districts, which was not as true when there was a huge middle in American politics which people could cater to. And so, I mean, think about you know what would you need to do in order to make Nancy Pelosi's congressional district competitive, right? You'd have to join it. Join Find it with, people in Fresno. I was going to say, you have to, no, you've got to join them with parts of rural Nevada. I mean, that's what's going, you know, so you're, it, it, is, it is very difficult. And that's not atypical, right? So, and you've seen the maps when they do sort of red and blue maps around the country as to uh, where the disproportionate uh, uh, Democratic and Republican votes are coming from. You get obviously large 
uh, in any of the big cities, for the most part, you're getting disproportionate Democratic majorities. Rural areas are going to get more Republican majorities. And so even under the best of circumstances, and I've, been, I, I've only worked for courts when I've drawn the, the districts, 80% um, of the districts are going to be non-competitive at the general election. Right? And the question is that remaining maybe 10 or 20%. So the answer to that is yes, but. And the reason I say yes, but is the first time any independent redistricting commission draws the districts, it has a big effect. Because they stop taking into account where the incumbents live. Uh, and so they create several districts that wouldn't be competitive if politicians were drawn. Well, it's also but, as compared yeah. to what? So yeah. be part of the problem yeah. <laughs> from a sort of political scientist standpoint yeah. is that California voters you know, didn't give us a good natural experiment because what they did is they changed both the redistricting commission and the open primary system at the same time. Yeah, the so top two. You ended up with this problem where, yeah, there was greater competition after the redrawing of the lines, and you had some of these Democrats, incumbent Democrats, that were drawn in you know, the uh, those in LA, the so-called Sherman Berman race, yeah. right, where you had these well-financed Democrats whose you know the yeah. biggest difference between them was two letters in their name, uh, and they you know they, they spent something like. I don't know, fifteen million dollars between them on a race, and so yeah, there's co competition. But you know, it, do, is that the kind of competition you're sort of looking for with independent redistricting? I'll say I was a skeptic about the California Commission, uh, and I think they did a remarkable job. I was sort of surprised that they did. Yeah, the as well the, did. the butt piece of it is we saw this in in um, uh, Arizona where it's the and that's second this, time this around. Case, this case is and, from Arizona. And, and the new is one. that the second time around? The polit various political groups in a state will have figured out more on how to game the system, how to approach the redistricting process, what to say to the independent commissioners to induce them to uh, draw districts one way or another. And so uh, a lot of what's going on with independent redistricting commissions, it's really hard to know the second time around whether you get the same benefits of kind of you know, perturbing the system you get the first time around. And the other thing is the Supreme Court has shown itself completely unwilling or unable to deal with partisan redistricting straightforwardly. So instead of saying we're going to come up with some rules about just how much partisanship there can be in the redistricting process, they try to ratchet up or use other rules as ways of getting there. And they've tried to use one person, one vote this way. And up until quite recently, the assumption was when you drew state legislative districts, as long as the biggest district and the smallest district didn't differ by more than 10% in their total population, the state could do whatever it wants. And the case that they have that's going to be decided the same day as the one person, one vote case is about whether you can look behind the curtain even when there are small deviations. Because the claim is that the Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission took partisanship too much into account, even though none of the districts is more than 10% larger than the smallest district. So the court is going to have to get into how much do they want courts trying to police the fairness of the political process. And I think a lot of the temptation for these independent redistricting commissions is if the courts aren't going to police the process at the back end, let's change how the process is done at the front end. Let's move to campaign finance, but one last question yeah, on this. Yeah, I think there, and, or, or and was he there had another his one? hand up as well. So the two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the partisan gerrymandering jurisprudence basically is one of those areas where you know Justice Kennedy is waiting to hear from the Oracle, you know, and and it's just up to him because you have four, four, and one uh, in the last case, and so there there is the possibility with this that a presidential election could affect the jurisprudence of partisan gerrymandering if there's a resignation. Um, Otherwise, look, I am a little bit afraid, actually, about the courts getting involved in this political thicket, as we, you know, to use them, only because I've dealt with, I've probably dealt with, I don't know, 25 judges at this point drawing districting plans for them. And 
you know, this, I, the, everyone who's employed me has been, you know, straight shooter and, and, and uh, done a great job, but stuff creeps into the, the process and it becomes extremely difficult for them to separate out what are legitimate and illegitimate redistricting principles. What we've done in California is a bit of a model. I mean, it's, it's, it, a, it is a Rube Goldberg kind of process that we have here, uh, but it did, uh, and so I think this is one of those areas where experimentation could, could maybe produce something. Yeah. Yeah. That's more like the California system where we have 15 and 555. The, the problem, you see, what happened in Arizona, and this is really the background to this case, is that you have the independent chair who then was accused of being biased toward the Democrats, and then she was impeached, you know, as you know from the Senate and... and and so it was a whole long drawn out issue. And, and look, to their credit, let me say that, I don't know how you feel about this, Pam, but I look, you, know, you look at, the, I don't think in the end the, uh, the plan that they drew was intentionally biased one way or the other, but they overpopulated the Republican districts, they underpopulated the Democratic districts, even though it's within the, say, plus or minus two or 3%. That would, you know, they, they should have had some better advice uh, on, on this. And, 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 you know, I think they're probably gonna get some harsh treatment at the court. Yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. Well, that what's happening in Texas is that this is the guy who's actually sponsoring this is also the guy who sponsored the challenge to the Voting Rights Act. He sponsored the challenge to the Affirmative Action Program, and so there. That's right. That that has a high citizen. I mean, there are so the people who are in high citizen areas. Yeah, yeah the, that, and that's what's happening. There are, there are two different things going on. One is the question of what's the legal claim and which sort of person has to be the plaintiff. And the person who has to be the plaintiff is somebody who lives in a district that has large numbers of citizens in it and says, and, and very few people who are non-citizens and says, my vote is being degraded. The question of who's going to benefit or lose from this is, honestly, the Republican Party benefits from this, from going to, to because the districts that are very that have la large numbers of non-citizens in them are all electing Democrats, and so if you require more of those people to be in the districts, then you will end up with seats that are now held by Democrats going to Republicans, um, because of just the nature of who lives in who lives in the districts that are involved. Um, so it's a, I mean, and this is true of a huge amount of voting rights litigation of all kinds that the claim is, sounds in one constitutional value and one or the other of the political parties is behind the claim. Because let's face it, honestly, as an individual voter, the question of what the weight of your individual vote is in a district that's going to have 200,000 people in it under one circumstance and 400,000 under the other circumstance is not big enough to make you want to spend your time and your money litigating this. And so it's always, you know, one of the political parties or the other is benefited or burdened by a particular, by a particular rule. And you can often tell this by just looking at, you know, who the counsel for the parties are at the end of the day. Why don't we move to campaign finance? Yeah, so finance. why don't we move to campaign finance? So in finance. the last 10 minutes or so. Um, so you're familiar with the Citizens United case. Um, but I'm going to tell you, you misunderstand it, okay? Which is because every, every time I talk about Citizens United, it, it, like I said, it's become a metaphor for everything that's wrong with the campaign finance system, and few people really know what the facts of that case are. And so the Citizens United case was about a 
movie, literally Hillary the movie, right, that was put on demand on uh, just like HBO On Demand or something like that, where you, the viewer, would then have to download that movie. And it was put up there by a nonprofit group that took some for-profit, with money from for-profit corporations. And it was a total hatchet job on Hillary Clinton, you know, um, as happens. Uh, and the, uh, often, <laughs> uh, but, but then the movie, um, it, was not, it was not a corporate television advertisement. It wasn't forced on you, the captive audience, the viewer. Uh, and uh, because it was a satellite communication within 30 days of the primary election in 2008, um, it got captured by the McCain-Feingold <laughs> campaign finance law, which says you may not have a satellite communication that refers to a clearly identified candidate for public office within 30 days of the primary, 60 days of the general. Right? And this case actually went up to the Supreme Court twice. Um, and in the first oral argument of it, uh, oral argument session, uh, the issue came up. Well, if the government's allowed to prohibit this, uh, this kind of treasury money, corporate treasury money, from being used for on-demand movies, what about a book? Could they prevent you from, from a corporation publishing Hillary the book? Right? And the guy said, well, that's not what this case is about. The guy, the acting solicitor general, Malcolm Stewart, said this. Uh, and then he got pushed and pushed. Justice Kennedy had a great line. He said, well, wait a second. And this, and this is when I teach this and looking at the technology, I, I, point, I play this oral argument. He says, wait a second, what's that new device? That Kindle thing? Uh, I suppose that's a satellite communication, right? That's, you're getting the, the book over the you know, Wi-Fi or something like that. Could you ban, I guess you, you could even ban books under the current law, right? And he tries to wiggle out of it. And then in the end, he says, just, Chief Justice Roberts says, what's the answer, right? What, yes or no? Could you ban the book? And he says, yes. And then there is this audible intake of air in the courtroom, I'm told, right? And so when I teach my First Amendment class, I, I say, look, if you learn nothing else in this course, jargon for the Supreme Court, don't be on the side of book banning, right? You know? And so uh, then it came up again. Elena Kagan then, as the Solicitor General, argues the case. Uh, she falls into it all as well. But that was the context in which Citizens United comes up. Now, of course, that doesn't mean you then have to say that corporations have the same First Amendment rights in the, in the campaign finance system as individuals. But that was, that was sort of the hook that, that um, this case was uh, hanging on. Um, for the most part, though, again, speaking as a political scientist, the money that you've seen in this election and the previous one is not corporate money. Okay. Um, and to the extent there is corporate money um, of the kind of Sheldon Adelson variety, it's closely held corporations, which are almost alter egos of the people. Most of the money, so-called super PACs, right, are almost all individual contributions, OK? And so most of the money that's coming into the process is um, of a type that has been legal for the most part for the last 40 years, OK? You, you could, the Supreme Court in Buckley versus Vallejo said, that individuals are allowed to spend as much money as they want advocating for the election or defeat a candidate. Right? And so that's where we are right now. Um, and and uh, you know, Citizens United, like I said, sort of maybe its, it's biggest effect has been cultural. So that general counsels to campaigns or to corporations previously might have said, well, you got to be careful here. Now it's like, no, you don't have to be careful. You can, you can uh, spend as much, as much money as you want. Interestingly enough, at least on the presidential level, um, you, you know, the people who are leading, um, well, on the Republican side at least, they're spending almost no money. <laughs> uh, Donald Trump, rich guy, to be sure. <coughs> Just ask him. Uh, 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 <laughs> but but uh, he, he has spent $1.5 million of his own money. That's it. Um, ben Carson, right? Nothing. The, Scott Walker, who is the, the alleged beneficiary of the Coke money, obviously is uh, no longer. Um, Jeb Bush just today fired or reduced the salaries of, of a significant amount of his uh, campaign staff. Uh, so you know the, how the, the political effect of this is actually quite complicated. Um, but it's actually become an uh, interesting political issue. We have our former colleague from Stanford, Larry Lessig, who you may have heard is running for president on campaign finance as being an issue. Bernie Sanders, to be sure, is, is uh, raising campaign finance as a big issue. Hillary Clinton has proposed you know, public funding. Donald Trump even today actually said that uh, super PACs should give, you know, the candidates should disclaim any super PACs. So it's, uh, it's a big issue. Yeah, I mean, I two, just two observations about this. One, the first observation is probably 
the article that I worked on that's been cited the most is an article called The Hydraulics of Campaign Finance Reform. And it makes the point that money in politics is like water. If you dam it up in one place, it will go someplace else. And what we've been doing since Watergate There's the dam is, there. yeah, yeah <laughs> the, the, is since Watergate, we have been tr restricting certain kinds of money that the Supreme Court allows to be restricted. And that money has just flowed into other areas. And there's a pretty good argument that we would have been better off not having had a huge amount of the campaign finance reform that we had, because then the money would be going to parties who, after all, at the end of the day, have to be accountable to voters in getting their candidates elected, rather than to single issue groups that don't have to tell you anything about who's giving the money to them and the like. And so a regime of disclosure and, uh, and the like might have been a better regime. The second point to make about campaign finance is it will be really interesting to see where we are 20 years from now because of a fundamental change in the way campaigns operate, which is that the money that flowed into the system in the period between, say, 1974 and now largely goes to broadcast media buys on the major networks. And the question of as people start to get their news more and more from other sources, whether the kind of campaigns that depended on the kind of money and the kind of spending that you needed in the broadcast era will still be the way of doing get out the vote uh, and motivating your own base to show up in a world in which people are not getting their, uh, their information from the major networks or even from major for-profit publications like the Times or USA Today or the local newspaper. And I know Nate is thinking about that a bunch, so maybe you want to say a minute about that, yeah. and then we can take maybe one, one or two well, questions. I'll say, come, I'm Ray. giving a lecture here, a public lecture on Tuesday at 5.30 or so if you're still around and want more of this, but it's on the, the campaign revolution will not be televised. And I have a piece in the American Interest magazine uh, last week on this. Um, because I've been working with folks in the Valley here on the, I mean, the interest, once campaign communication moves to the internet, and by the internet, we don't just mean the internet, it's also these like on-demand platforms through TV because your TV is going to change as a device. Um, it's hard to regulate it anyway. And, and to some extent, it's Google, Facebook, and these other um, platforms that are going to be the main regulators of political communication and campaign finance. That's a sort of whole different way of thinking about this. Uh, but why don't we end with some questions on this? Yeah. For the most part, given Citizens United and the other cases, uh, public financing is pretty much the public financing and disclosure are the main avenues for reform. Almost anything else is going to run into constitutional and administrative problems. That's right. That's true. Well, that's true. Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. So on the first thing, there is, so the political science on this is kind of complicated about whether the more money you have, does it actually increase your probability of victory, right? And that, that's a very complicated relationship. The short answer is no, but there is a threshold. Obviously, if you have nothing, then you have no chance. 
And the question is, when do marginal returns diminish? Okay, but that's a quick response to a complicated question. On access, there's also really no debate, no question that people who give money get access. On influence, it becomes really difficult because then you have to figure out in an alternative universe where there wasn't a campaign contribution, how would they have voted? How would they have performed on a particular issue? And that's, that's where um, the, the evidence is hard to find, right? And part of it is given how polarized our political system is right now and how predictable now uh, congressmen's vote is based on political party, the money, you know, <laughs> it, if any of the, the money, I mean, where money is going to have its biggest effect is on a low salience issue, right? Or on whether something gets put on the legislative calendar, stuff below the radar, right? Uh, they, they, then you're going to see uh, big effects. And for the most part, uh, you know, corporations spend a lot more on lobbying than they do on campaign contributions, and that's the area where they spend at least 10 times as much. And so that's, that's what's uh, the next thing. Um, we, need to, we need to stop, because I know you all have somewhere else that you're supposed to be fairly soon. Um, we'll stay around for a little while, so if people want to just chat with us, that would be great. But I want to you know, not keep the rest of it. <laughs>